uh, recall uh, from DC. Uh, because I could just give you the answer and tell you what the punchline is, but I think it's really interesting to kind of go and, and, and connect the dots here. So let's have a basic circuit, uh, which has been reduced to a Thevenin equivalent, which means there's a Thevenin voltage, and then there's a Thevenin uh, equivalent resistance, right? And this can basically be any circuit can be reduced to basically a Thevenin circuit, right? So you have an A terminal and a B terminal. So over here on the left, I've drawn it like this, but it could be any circuit, some crazy mesh situation or whatever. And it's connected to some load resistor that we're calling um, RL. All right. And the bottom line is, because you have a, a simple source flowing through two resistors like that, there's some value of I that's flowing down like this. Now, of course, everything off to the left over here, this is all the Thevenin, you know, the Thevenin equivalent uh, stuff here. And we're calling this the source of the circuit. So this could be a voltage source which has some resistance in, uh, involved in it. And then this we're calling as the load. Now back when we talked about maximum power transfer, that whole idea was, you know, you have some source and some source resistance. What value of the load do you put here to make the power from this source a maximum that's transferred into the load? Um, and, and it's a very practical thing because a lot of times what you're trying to do when you're developing circuits is to make sure that the efficient transfer of power is happening from the source to the load. All right. So the way you kind of go down and do this, and the reason I'm kind of backtracking is because we're going to make the jump to AC and it's going to look really similar. Um, so the power absorbed uh, by RL, by the resistive load that we have here, is P is equal to I squared times R right? I squared R. That's what that is. Now we have I drawn on the circuit. We have R drawn on the circuit. So everything's there. Um, so essentially, what is the value of I here? When you think about it, this value of I is just V over the sum of these resistors. That's the value of I that we have. So we can kind of substitute that in place. So it'll be V Thevenin over um, R Thevenin plus RL. This is the current that's flowing through the load resistor, which is now being squared and then multiplied again by RL. That's going to be the power uh, that we are basically transmitting to this guy. So you see, let's just take a look and examine this for a second here. So you see, we have freedom of choice when it comes to RL frequently when you're de defining the load. You want to choose a value of the load resistance that makes the maximum am amount of power transferred to that load. You don't have freedom of, of V Thevenin or R Thevenin. That's some, something in the, back in the source area. We're going to keep that fixed. So if you really think about that, let's take two extremes. Okay, First, let's talk about what happens if the load resistance is zero. So if you put a short circuit here, there's no load resistance at all. What happens? Well, this is going to go to zero. You're still going to have a fraction that's going to be divided by this. But this on the outside is going to be zero. So it's going to cut everything down. If you choose a load resistance of zero, you're going to get zero watts um, basically transferred or, or, or transferred to the, to the load. right? So that's extreme number one. Now, if you take the other extreme, let's say that we choose infinity, the largest possible resistance we can uh, for it. Then, yeah, th out here, infinity, that's going to certainly try to make this very big, but look what's happening in the fraction. If you make this infinity, then the bottom of this fraction goes to infinity. So the entirety of the fraction goes to zero, which is going to chop everything down. So when you choose an infinity for a load resistance, this is going to cause everything to go to zero. So no matter which end of the spectrum you choose, if you choose a zero for a load resistance, or if you choose infinity for a load resistance, you're going to get zero watts delivered to the load. So there clearly has to be some happy medium somewhere in the middle where you get a maximum power transfer. On either extreme, you get zero, but somewhere in the middle, there's going to be some nice balance where you get a maximum power transfer. Now, the way we figure that out uh, is we uh, take the derivative and set it equal to zero. So what we do is we take the derivative. We go back to our, our friends in calculus, because when the derivative of something is equal to zero, it means you're at the peak, right? You're at the peak of the curve before it comes down on the other side. So what you have is the derivative of this power function with respect to the load resistance, because that's what we can vary, you want to set it equal to zero. 
right? So what you do, and I'm not gonna do it here for you, is notice we have an RL in here and we have an RL here. So if you take the derivative of this, it's gonna get kind of messy because this is all squared and then you have something out here too. So you'll have quotient rule going on from calculus and the chain rule going on from calculus and you're gonna get a large expression. And when you set it equal to zero, you wanna figure out what value of the load resistance is gonna make this derivative, this giant derivative, once we calculate it, I'm not gonna write it down, what, what uh, makes it equal to zero. So it turns out uh, that for, I'll just write it over here, we found for DC, you probably remember this, that maximum power transfer whoops, transfer, is when the load resistance is equal to the Thevenin resistance. And I will go ahead and just kind of circle this because this is important. All right, and what that means is, and, and this is probably all coming back to you if you haven't looked at it in a while, is when you have some source with some source resistance, and remember any circuit can be boiled down to a Thevenin like this, where you have some load hanging off the end. What you want to do is you want to choose, for DC circuits anyway, you want to choose the load resistance to be exactly equal to this internal resistance of the source. And when you do that, you get a maximum amount of watts, a maximum amount of power transferred to the load, right? And if you start deviating and start, like if you make this a variable resistor and start turning the knob, anywhere off of that that perfect condition, then you're going to get fewer watts. If you start increasing the load resistance more, you're going to get less power transferred there. And if you start decreasing it on either side of that perfect value here, you're going to get less number of watts transmitted or transferred into that. And we took the extreme cases. We looked at, hey, what happens when this is zero and when this is infinity, and we verified that for ourselves. All right, so now we want to kind of go and uh, take a look at what's going to happen in the AC case. So what I want to do is let me go and move this up to the top of the screen and let's just continue drawing. Now for AC, things are very, very similar, but they're a little more complicated. So what we'll have is any circuit can be boiled down to a Thevenin uh, source, but instead of some resistance, it's going to have what we call a Thevenin impedance, right? So it could be capacitive, inductive, resistive, don't know, right? So things are just a little more complicated, but you still have some terminal A and you have some terminal B and you have some load, but it's not a resistance hanging off. It's some uh, impedance, some load impedance hanging off here, right? Like this. And so the same sort of thing is going to uh, apply. This, we're going to go ahead and just kind of draw a little dotted line here, same as we did before. This we call the source and this we call the load. All right, but the same exact problem applies. What value of this load impedance do we need to choose to make the maximum amount of power? And then, by the way, when I say maximum power, I'm talking about the maximum real power, P, maximum real power, P. That's what we're interested in being transmitted and transferred into the load. When we talk about maximum power transfer, I'm talking about maximum average real power, P. That's what I'm interested in. All right, so let's kind of go through the similar little thought experiment, little operation. We're not going to do all of the math here, but we can do a lot of it just to kind of give you uh, an idea of where we're going. So the Thevenin impedance, don't forget, has a real part, so we'll call it uh, R Thevenin, plus some imaginary part. I'll call it X Thevenin. So it, really, I don't know if it's capacitive or inductive. So this, this reactance here, I don't know if it's positive or negative, but in general, it's going to be a real part plus some imaginary part. That's what's inside of this box right here. And likewise, the load impedance also has a real part, so I'll call it R sub L, and it also has some imaginary part, X sub L. So inside of this box is some resistive element, and again, I don't know capacitive or inductive, but I'm going to label it as X. All right. So the same sort of thing imply, uh, is, 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 is kind of the same path we're going to go. There is some current that's flowing around this circuit. How do we find out what it is? It's going to be V divided by the sum of these impedances, right? So let me change colors here. The current uh, flowing through the load is going to be equal to uh, V Thevenin. Now, in this case, it's a phaser, right? Because all of our sources are now in the AC domain. They're all phasers. So I'm going to write it down as a phaser right here. And it's going to be divided by the sum of these two impedances. But each of these impedances has a real and imaginary part. So just to save a little bit of space, I'm going to write it as R Thevenin plus RL, that's just adding the real parts together, plus J, and I'm going to write it as X Thevenin um, plus XL. 
basically I'm just summing up these two impedances, but I'm just making the real parts together and putting the imaginary parts together. Nothing special. The other thing is, um, just to make the calculations a little easier to describe later on, this source uh, guy we're going to assume is RMS. Uh, RMS value given to us there. All right, so now we know what the current is flowing. Let me get rid of that. Now we know what the current is flowing down through the load. Now what do we do? We need to write down what the power is that's being transferred to that guy. And remember, we're interested in the real power, right? So the average real power delivered to the load. is what? Well, average real power is going to be magnitude I load squared, assuming it's you know RMS and all that stuff, uh, times RL. Now this comes straight from when you think about it, we were doing AC a long time, we said the power through any impedance, the complex power through any impedance is magnitude I squared times Z, right? Um, but we're, we're not really, we don't really care about the whole entirety of the complex power because we said when we're talking about maximum power transfer, we only care about the real power. So really this is the same thing. It's I squared times the real part. If we just put uh, Z here, R plus J, you know, put the whole thing here, then we would get the complex power. But we're writing down just the real power, so it's I squared times the real part. All right? So this is just the number of watts delivered to the, res to the you know, to, the, to that load that's right there. All right? So how do we actually figure this out? It's the same sort of thing. You notice I'm kind of like hiding the complexity here a little bit because now, look at how complicated it is. The load current has got a phaser on top with a complex number on the bottom, right? And we also have not one but two knobs to play with because we have this knob and I should say no, the load resistance and we have the load reactance or the you know, the imaginary part of that load. So what we're going to basically end up having to do is we're going to make do the same thing we did before. We're going to make the derivative equal to zero, but now we have two knobs to play with. So really what you're going to have is the partial derivative of P with respect to XL, and you want to make that equal to zero. And at the same time, so I'll put an and, you want to take the partial derivative of P with respect to RL and make it equal to zero. Now here's where I need to kind of come clean a little bit with you, all right? I debated and debated and debated if I should do all of these calculations and show you this derivation. Sometimes when I'm doing things, I think it's really worth it to, to, to jump into it and to dive into it and show all the calculus. Um, this is not one of those times because what's gonna end up happening is I'm gonna fill the entire board up and the conclusion is gonna make so much sense in a few minutes that you're gonna feel like you almost didn't even need to, to go through all of that work. But the bottom line is here, here's the load current. Right? Here's the power delivered to the, the real power delivered to the load. So you have to take the magnitude of this thing squared, right? And then you have to square it, and then you have to multiply by RL. And it doesn't really look so bad at first glance, but what you're going to end up having to do is stick this whole thing in here, take its magnitude and square it, right? So that's going to be a bunch of square terms running around. Notice you got these guys here, which are going to all, all be squared as well. But then after that, you have to take the derivative, the partial derivative of that large expression with respect to one variable, xl, right? And then you have to do it again separately, a totally different derivative with respect to rl, because these are the two knobs you can turn. You see, just like before, the only knob we had for the resistive case was just the resistor. So we just took the derivative of the power with respect to the load resistor, we figured out what that value was. But here we have an impedance hanging off the end. So we actually have two parts of this guy. We have the real part and the imaginary part. So we put it all in there, we square it, we take one derivative, this is gonna end up being a large expression. When you have done enough calculus, take derivatives of large fractions like this, this is gonna be a large expression. So will this, and they're going to be different. Then you have to set them equal to zero. Then you have to do some algebra to figure out what value of this will make it equal to zero and what value of this will make it equal to zero. None of it is insurmountable, but it just takes a lot of space for a really obvious conclusion that you're gonna love when we you know, dump it out here for you. So when we do that, I'm gonna boil the conclusion down for you right, here, right, right now. In AC analysis, the maximum power transfer exists when the load impedance is equal to the Thevenin impedance conjugate. That's what that asterisk means, so I'm going to circle that. 
That's it. That's the bottom line. When you do all of the calculus to do the partial derivatives and you set the different terms equal to zero, and you're going to figure out there's going to be some fractional parts that'll cancel out when certain things are met, and you're going to figure out that when you select this load impedance up here, when you select this load impedance to be equal to this impedance internally, but the conjugate of it, then you get maximum real power transferred into that load. And let me just show you a single little simple example as to how this can happen, and we'll tie it back to the DC case. What if you had some source here, call it V thevenin, and let's say internally it had 5 ohms, um, and then, eh, I don't like the way that looks, let's erase that. And then here we have some inductance here, like this, and the inductance was, let's say, J10 ohms. What it's basically saying is that if I'm going to hang a load on the end, I want to choose this load to have a 5 ohm real part, and I want to choose it to have a capacitive component of negative J10 ohms. This is what this is basically saying. And when I select a load that does that, then I'm going to have maximum real power transferred from the source into the load. All right? Now what's really happening when you look at it is, notice that whenever these are, when you take, say this is the conjugate like this, all that's happening is you're choosing this imaginary part to be the opposite of this one. So if you add them all together, these imaginary parts are going to go away. They disappear because they're equal and opposite when you add them. See, they're in series with one another, so you add them. And then the real parts, which is the resistive parts, is exactly the same case as it was in the DC case. In the DC case, we said we want to choose the load resistance to match the internal resistance. That's what we've done. The only additional thing we've done is we've chosen the external imaginary part to cancel with the internal imaginary part. That's all wrapped up in what this means right here. That is why maximum power transfer happens, because you're canceling the imaginary part, you're getting rid of it, and then, since the 5 ohms matches with the 5 ohms, it pretty much looks like it's not a DC case, all right? But it's, the analog is there, the, the similarity is there. And I'm avoiding all that calculus to show you that. If you go through and take these derivatives and set them equal to zero, you're going to find that it only works whenever the load XL is equal to the internal, the negative of the internal X thevenin, and when the load resistance is equal to the thevenin resistance. When you put those two conditions together, that means the load impedance must be equal to the thevenin impedance conjugate. That's the rule of thumb. So we're going to close it here. We're going to go on to the next section and actually solve some problems, but that is really, really, really interesting and, and useful for you. A lot of times when you have a speaker or a loud horn, you know, a loud speaker or a megaphone or something like that, or it even comes into play later on when you're talking about um, you know transmission lines and, and, and microwave radiation and other things like that you're often trying to get as much power from the source to get into your load sometimes your load is an antenna that's shooting waves out somewhere and you want to make sure that that happens and this is telling you the condition I'm oversimplifying okay some of these cases you might might be slightly different but the basic idea is the same this is showing you the condition to make that happen you want that load the real the real value of it the real um, uh, resistance of it to be equal to the internal resistance of your source or your driving circuit while you want the imaginary part to be the negative or the conjugate of the imaginary part of your source and when that happens you get maximum power going from here to here. Alright so follow me on to the next section we'll solve some practical problems to demonstrate how it works. Learn anything at mathandscience.com